Hi and welcome to AXA Coral Live. It is wonderful to have you with us. We are at the Kamabi Research Station for this very special Meet the Expert Live lesson. And that's on the island of Curaçao, Curaçao in the Southern Caribbean, part of the Netherlands Antilles, and just off the coast of Venezuela. Now, Kamabi is a field research station and it's amazing both for the scientists who study here full time but perhaps more so for all those visiting scientists from around the world who come here for a few weeks or even months. And as a field research station, Kamabi offers a number of things to scientists. It gives you a home from home from your full university or for the full time place of study. It gives you access to all that equipment that you might have back at your university but you want close to your area of study, microscopes, laboratory space to do your sample analysis and even wet labs. We had a great tour of the wet lab and some of the experiments taking place there yesterday with Mark. But it's not just a research station, that could be anywhere, but it's a field research station. And it's not really a field, you can sort of probably see behind me, not much grass growing, but the field is what we call the great outdoors, the area of nature that we're studying. And for us, the field here is the amazing coral reef. And so scientists can access that, all the dive equipment, sometimes rebreathers if they're going really deep on the reef, sometimes it's normal scuba and that means they can get easy access to the environment, do their experiments, collect their samples and then come back to the lab facilities here to do that initial analysis, processing, perhaps even further experiments to look at how the reef works and the amazing animals that rely on it. Now this is a Meet the Expert uh, live session and I'm incredibly delighted to welcome Nick uh, to Coral Live. Thank you so much uh, for, for being me. part of Coral Live, Nick. Really great to have you here. But before we start and get into, I know you've got this amazing equipment in front of you. We've also got some, some little uh, sort of footage and, and, and animations that you've been creating. I'm really looking forward to those as well. But we've got schools from around the world watching, so it's going to be a, a hello to those watching. Uh, we have schools from the UK, Ukraine, uh, Poland, US, um, and that's amazing. So hello to all the students there. And we've got some special shout outs. Um, so we have a shout out to Discovery Primary School in London, UK. And thank you so much for joining us again. Hi to all the students there. Really lovely to have you. Uh, we've got Flourish School watching as well. So hi to all the students there. Um, uh, brilliant to have Odessa NVK Gymnasium 7. Uh, in Ukraine uh, tuning in so that's great to have you guys with us and last but not least uh, we have a shout out to Lewiston uh, Elementary and they're joining us for a very very early start um, I wonder which country you're in probably the US um, been seeing the big cold snap in the US so hopefully we're not making you too jealous here um, about 30 degrees Celsius where we are at the moment. Um, Nick, you're uh, one of the researchers here at Kamaba. You're part of the, the sponge team. Mm -hmm. And um, you've got some amazing things to show us. But just briefly, if we can talk about sort of what your area of sort of research interest is mm -hmm. and what brings you to Kamabi. Sure. Well, thanks for being here. Hi, uh, next generation uh, of this planet. Uh, I'm happy to explain to you what we're actually doing in the field and why I do it. Um, and the reason I'm, I'm doing marine biology is obviously because of my love for nature and for the ocean. Um, and as you and Jamie just mentioned, we actually have a really nice setup here at Kamabi. We have our lab in the back, we have our office, then here's the dive shop and the reef is right out here so we can basically do everything uh, on one day and uh, yeah my interest is basically the the general coral reef ecology so I'm more interested I'm, I'm part of the sponge group 
uh, Jasper, my boss, was talking here a couple of days ago. But my interest lies actually in how, how a coral reef itself works. So I look at the system as a whole. Uh, and that goes back all the way to you know, several centuries when Darwin was already sailing on these reefs. And he was putting one and one together. He saw that really crystal clear water that has almost nothing in it, mm -hmm. uh, as he figured. And then he saw these incredibly productive ecosystems, uh, incredibly diverse. And he was asking himself, how do they sustain themselves? And that question went through the centuries and only for the last five, six decades, since we have died here really, we're able to look at these systems in more detail. And we're able to start answering these questions. Um, so a lot of this has come up, but uh, a lot of these questions that, that explain how coral reefs function as a system are still open. And that's my interest. That's what I want to answer. I mean, so, so, so just to put that, I mean, I, I think, you know, that, that voyage by Darwin and that initial question by Darwin, because those clear waters mm -hmm. that we love in, 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 in the tropics, mm -hmm. that means that there's very little food in them. Very little nutrients, very little energy. So mm -hmm. obviously the organisms living on a reef need some external source. Uh, to get that energy, and that's the sunlight. We've, okay. already, we've already found out that coral reefs are basically biological solar cities. Uh, okay. A lot of photosynthesis is happening, just like on land, by plants, but also by animals that harbor plants, which I guess was also covered already. Um, and all these systems, all these individual functions basically capture the energy from the sun, uh, from the, and a little bit of CO2 and water, and then they produce these sugars, and th those sugars sustain the system. Okay. However, we also found that a lot of this energy le leaks out of the system. Uh -huh. um, there's many reasons for that. For example, uh, you have sedimentation. A lot of the sediment, not like on land, is not lying on the ground, it's actually okay. suspended in the water. And if you're a coral and you live in that water, this sediment is going to land on top of you. Yep. And you don't have hands to pick out this, the sand pieces, right? So you need another strategy. So what corals do is they release mucus to kind of slide off the sediment and keep their surfaces clean and uh -huh. that mucus is energy that's dissolved yeah. compounds sugar is another compound and this would actually lead to other system like the water would carry it away but this is not what's happening okay there's a lot of mechanisms capturing this energy maintaining it in the system and this is these are the things we measure i mean this is absolutely fascinating how that these very closed cities, how they can keep all the food and energy trapped in them. And we've got always what looks like a sort of energy trap in front of you. It's probably not, but what, what no. have we got here? So this is a, what we call an incubation chamber. Okay. Uh, incubation just means you're putting something in a confined space and you okay. wait. Uh -huh. um, and so we have just a simple cylinder with a lid and a base plate. There's some O-rings here to seal this. Okay. And then we have a couple of tools in there. Uh, first of all, we have two sampling ports. Uh, out of these sampling ports, we can take water samples from the inside. If we do this over time, you can see how the water changes. Now imagine we have a coral in here, then we can actually, by looking at the water samples, we can, we can figure out what this coral is doing. Um, but one sampling port is not enough, because okay. again, this is sealed. We have something like a pressure equality that we want, so if, if I don't have a second hole that I can open. I yes. cannot pull any water out. Aha. So I need to open this and open this. And now I can pull water out of one of these tubes. Okay, got so it. So I leave, leave this a little bit away so I get clean water into my chamber while taking water out of the chamber into a simple syringe like this. And we take this back to the lab and then we analyze it for its uh, components. Now, this, this looks super, super easy. Uh, but, you know, working underwater must be a little bit more tricky. Oh, it so, definitely is. So, what, what's, I mean, it's, sometimes it looks like you're working in space. So, so, can you describe a little bit about what, you know, being underwater and working underwater is like? Sure. Um, so, if you do a, an experiment underwater, obviously you're flying, which is really cool. But it does come with some challenges. We have to make sure that all our equipment is fixed. Otherwise, it will just float or sink away, uh, which happens sometimes, yep. unfortunately. Uh, we have to be sometimes upside down. We have to make sure we don't steer up the sediment, which will affect our measurements. So you have to be really stable in the water. Uh, you have to know your buoyancy. And then, obviously, like in space, if you push something, you're going to be pushed away from it. 
actio equals reaction, right? Yeah. So you cannot just handle things. You're going to be pushed away while you're handling things. So you need to kind of figure out your style, use your fins, use your whole body to kind of yeah be stable while doing your work on the water. And I mean, you, you, you hear that you can learn to dive in a, in a couple of weeks. How long does it take to sort of master these techniques or be able to do, to do science underwater? Uh, that's a good question and um, that varies a lot. That's okay. different from person to person. Um, I've had students that just finished their diving license, yep. came with me and did things almost perfectly from the very beginning. So there, there is a talent you can have for this. But I've also had students that were really challenging and then they come here with me for two yeah. months, they practice and after two months they're good. I mean this is not uh, rocket science, no. it's an intuitive skill that you just learn by doing or that you already have. If you okay, do. brilliant. And, and so you've described um, this bit of, bit of kit. Mm -hmm. um, what's it like to work with this underwater and, how, and sort of what kind of measurements do you take and how, and how does that work? So what we take, we, we take the water samples and we take yeah. back to the lab and then we look at different components, nutrients, energy in its different forms. There's dissolved compounds, particulate compounds and all these things are changed by the organisms we put in here. So then we measure those over time. But these two things yeah. are actually quite challenging because these are electronic devices. So the, the pump on top and the oxygen meter. Exactly. So this is an oxygen logger. And it's one that looks a bit like a rocket. More or less, exactly. Yeah. It's a great tool. It measures oxygen every minute. The sensor is right here. So if we put yeah. that into the chamber, we essentially get a reading of how much oxygen is in this water okay. every minute. And uh, things that photosynthesize, produce oxygen, uh, animals that respire, uh, take the oxygen out. So by measuring oxygen in this chamber, we can look at what the organism is doing and uh, how active it is. However, if we just sit this chamber down here, the water is going gonna, gonna to sit and it's not going to move much. Uh -huh. So we need to make sure there is a continuous circulation in this chamber. And that we do with this little piece. If I get this out. There we go. Hold on to that for you. There's O-rings in here too, so it's all tight. Eh? So this is basically a battery pack and then there's a magnetic steer here. You can see it turns because it's turned on right now. And what this does, it just circulates the water to make sure that it's, there's a good continuous movement. Uh, it's good for the animal or the plant that we have in there, but it's also good for our measurements. There we go. So when we measure oxygen, we of course want the water to be mixed continuously so we get a nice reading. Otherwise, the water starts layering depending where your sensor is, you're going to get a wrong reading. So, and these electronic devices, they like to do a particular thing. Yep. They like to get water inside ah. and then we can basically throw them away. So a big challenge is making sure that all these things are properly sealed, particularly our electronic devices. Okay. Amazing. And so when you're underwater with this, you've got the bit of coral in here and then you're using a, a syringe to... To sample water from inside. Basically, okay. I put this in here. I make sure there's a little bit away that has several reasons yep. and then I just sample through the syringe water okay. from inside and this we can take back to the lab we keep it cool and then we analyze it for its different components and, and what kind of, of different measurements are you looking for in here are you looking for the amount of sugar the amount of food that's still available exactly the food in its different forms we look okay. at waste products yep. uh, inorganic nutrients yeah. Uh, just like us, animals on the reef release wastes. But these wastes are also not swapped away. They are also recycled by other organisms. So we put corals in here to see what is produced, what is wasted. Then we put yep. algae in here to, to see what they take up and what they produce. And sponges as well, other organisms. And then we see that everything kind of fits well. You know, these organisms like those stuff, which is released by those organisms, and then they feed on what is released by these ones. So everyone is kind of feeding each other. It's a real whole web of, of different uh, trajectories, of different energy pathways from one organism to the other. Every, everything's Every, working it's, it's, together. It's an amazing interdependence of life that you sort of think that you understand the system, well, we don't. and then there's layers <laughs> and layers and layers yeah. uh, to unpeel. I mean, I think that, you know, thinking about, you know, the, the science I did at school, we were always saying, you know, 
how how do you how do you sort of make sure that what you're doing is is fair? How do you make sure that you're actually measuring mm-hmm. what you think you're measuring? Mm-hmm. And you know, you've talked about this amazing bit of kit. You you you've talked about the difficulty of working underwater. Mm-hmm. But if you're doing an experiment in the sea, I mean, it's not going to be like a lab where you can control things. How on earth? Yeah. Do you make sure that it, that it all works? You can actually identify mm-hmm. the changes you think are happening. So we do that by just monitoring the different okay. elements. So obviously, right in the field, we cannot just keep everything stable and then change one variable and then yeah. in the end be sure that's what caused our effect. But uh, what we can do is we can keep track of all of the different environmental variables and then change one variable significantly look at our results but then be able to go back and see what have we actually compared where did the how did the temperature develop how did the salinity develop all those things that vary in the field we measure them and then we try to you know my work is a lot of thinking as yes, well looking yes. at my results and just trying to wrap my head around what's actually going on and i mean uh, there's rumors of you make, putting tents Mm-hmm. Is that true? Yeah, I think we have a photo of it. Yeah. So uh, that shows, it, I like this photo because it shows all the different sensors we have in there. Um, we, we measure obviously oxygen again using these loggers yeah. in those larger tents, but we also put an oxygen logger outside. Because if you put a tent on the reef, it enables us to, to incubate an entire patch, an entire community, okay. rather than just a single organism. But obviously you cannot make it tight, right? Yeah. Uh, so there will be some leakage through the reef framework or through the sediment, whatever you put your tent on. And that's actually a challenge because you get water from outside. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, my collaborating team came up with this great idea to turn that into an opportunity and to okay. actually make it a flow-through incubation. So now we, we, we have natural replenishment of outside water, which actually eliminates a lot of the problems when you have an incubation. You know, imagine there's an organism that feeds some bacteria you only have a certain amount of bacteria in this chamber, so when that's all gone, the organism is not going to do what it does in the, nat- in the natural field. But if you have replenishment, then you eliminate that problem. But then we need to keep track of how much water actually goes in. I m- imagine that's a really, really difficult thing about doing science on the coral reef, is that you want to mimic the, what's happening mm-hmm. for real mm-hmm. uh, on the reef, uh, but you also want to control some things to study that balance between sort of having everything changing and the water coming in and out and the complexities yeah, yeah. of life mm-hmm. and yet trying to work out exactly what happening. It must be a very difficult balance it to It is strike. difficult, it's not, if not impossible, to do everything at the same time. That's yeah. why when we do this work, we usually separate these two things. We have experimental manipulation yeah. where we only have one factor varying after in a wet lab here or in a laboratory setting. Yeah. And then we look at its effect, and then we have field verification. And there we don't try to identify effects, we just try to verify these effects. Okay. So despite all the variation in the other environmental variables that's going on, if we can get a signal in the field that matches somewhat the very manipulated signal we have, yeah. then we did both. Okay. But doing it at the same time <laughs> is probably impossible. Probably impossible. Yeah. Uh, amazing, um, and what what I found fascinating, having having talked to yourself and 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 your team, is that the reef is super super, you know, complex in structure, and that um, you know we we've talked a lot um, o- o- over the past uh, few days about the importance of coral creating these hard structures and, and, and creating a habitat for, for, for other life. Mm-hmm. And it's almost, it's these, these are the builders of exactly. the coral ecosystem. Uh, they're not the only life form there, but these are the ones that build these amazing underwater cities. Mm-hmm. And for students watching, they may have seen photographs of the reef, but probably only sort of like aerial photos looking down. Mm-hmm. That doesn't give us a true representation of what's happening. Exactly. So, um, one information ahead. If you imagine a coral like this growing, and then you imagine another coral and another coral, you can easily imagine this dome just lifting up, right? Yeah. So you would have basically a mountain. 
But that's not what, what we see on the reef. What we see is a much more complex structure where everything kind of goes in and out and you have crevices and holes and overhangs. So what's happening is, yes, the corals are building these structures, but they're also being destroyed systematically. There's organisms that bore into the structure. Okay. They're producing holes and crevices. We have uh, dissolution from the water that partly dissolves the structure. So all these construction and destruction processes actually yep. create an incredibly complex structure with a lot more surface area than what you would see if you just simply look down on it. And frankly, this is what we scientists actually do as well because it's very, it's, it's very difficult to get a lot of, it's very expensive to go diving, it's very time consuming, um, it's, it's for feasibility reasons, yeah, we take pictures from above yeah. and then we look at what we see and then that's our community. But I think you've, you've prepared something for us exactly, to really yeah. show the complexity of what's going on. Yeah. Um, I think Ellie's just going to load up. I mean, it was quite amazing looking at it yesterday, but c come around so you, you, can, you can see um, what we're, what we're sh showing on the broadcast. And just talk the classes who are watching mm -hmm. um, through what they can, they can see as it comes up. Okay, so I did this study on, a, uh, on 200 individual square meters across the whole island. This is one square meter, so one of these samples. And you, what you see there is basically just a structure of reefs from above. We only have data points on this one. And we took photos from, very, from many different angles. There's this uh, technique called photogrammetry, which, which only recently became uh, available open source. So we can now use this, this software for free. What you do is you, you take a whole bunch of images from one structure, you feed it into the software, and it creates the, this accumulation of data points. And what you can then do is you can look at the direction of these data points, and, and that tells you a bit more of the three-dimensional structure. So now you can get a 3D surface area. And we already see here that this is not a flat structure, that we have several crevices, indentations, that there's a lot more going on than is what meets the eye from above. And then we can give it some texture and uh, take some of the imagery also and add those information and even some shading. So then we can see which surfaces are actually you know, open and exposed to sunlight and which surfaces are not. And the surfaces that are not, we call those cryptic surfaces. So the so-called cryptic habitat is everything in the reef that does not receive a lot of sunlight because it's shaded. And cryptic is really just a word for hidden. For hidden, exactly. Yeah. Cryptic is a fancy word for hidden, more or less. Um, so what we see there, we, when we analyze this, this uh, three-dimensional model, then we see that in, instead of just one planar square meter, we actually have six square meters of surface area in only this part that you can see. And that's still not the whole picture, because now if you look down, you can actually see this an incredible area of more cryptic habitat beneath this surface. And all of this you would simply miss if you look from above. Um, so the total surface area that we have in this square meter of reef is up 17 square meters. So basically that's half an entire classroom uh, of surface area just cramped up in this tiny little space. And if you, if you zoom down in, you can see that the communities in these cryptic spaces is very different from the community that we see on top. Instead of, you know, these macroalgae and corals, we have a variety of filter feeding organisms. The colorful things here, you see the yellow, the red, that's, those are sponges. Uh, there's bryozones, tunicates, all kinds of fancy animals that uh, many people don't know, but they do very important things on the reef. And you can, we can measure how the things that are released by the communities on the reef are being taken up by the communities that live inside the reef and vice versa. So these, the, the inner reef and the outer reef are working together and we've spent decades looking at the outer reef and we've only in the last decade started looking at the inner reef. I mean, absolutely amazing. And thank you so much uh, for showing that to us, because it really, you know, to go from one square meter um, looking down, and that's almost, um, you know, you can probably see the size of your desk in the classroom, but then to go to 
17 square meters of living space or surface even not even living space um, you can call it living space yeah. because but the, every single yeah. square meter inside these cryptic surfaces mm -hmm. is covered yeah. by organisms and plants there's not a single bit of free space I mean it's, and and it's just incredible because I mean when, when, when you were going through this, I was thinking that it's like if you had an aerial photo of a skyscraper or a city block um, and you thought you could, you could see all the life in there just by looking down. But in fact, you need to really bring the camera around, explore, go inside mm -hmm. and, and really get that sense yeah. of, of, of this three-dimensional living space yeah. and all the different processes and, and living things that occupy it. Yeah. Or in the forest, if you look yes. down from on a forest, you're just going to see a canopy of trees. Yes. You're not going to be able to see the species of lowland plants yeah. or animals that live in there. You really need to get inside the system, which is quite feasible in terrestrial systems, most terrestrial systems, yeah. but very difficult in the water. And that's why we we had to wait for the technology to get there okay. so we can go explore these systems. And the technology is only getting more. Huh? So. We, we, we get more ability to look at the system uh, and there's so much to still find out so it only gets more exciting. I mean it's thank you because I mean that, that for me just really brought home a, a lot of the things we talk about. We've got some great questions mm -hmm. uh, coming through sure. um, from classes. We've got first of all we are in uh, Gdansk in Poland mm -hmm. um, with some questions there. Thomas would like to know are sponges sensitive? Ooh, that's a very general question. Um, I would say, like us, they are sensitive to some things and not sensitive to others. So um, if you look at uh, a colleague of mine, Misha, she's actually looking at the, the effect of iron on sponges. Okay. Um, and she's finding that there's, um, there's some negative effects, there's some sensitivities to iron, but there's also some species of sponges that, are, that don't really care if there's a lot of iron in the water. Um, I would say in a more general sense, no. Sponges are probably not that sensitive because we see that they're doing well on most of these reefs and we actually see that we have a trajectory from you know, sort of more coral, um, more coral domination in the past to, to ecosystems more dominated by sponges. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, that really leads on to Gustav's question, which is what do you think is the future mm -hmm. of coral reefs? The future of quarries will much likely depend on us. Yes. Um, obviously we can you know, do a lot about these different stressors, these local aspects and these global aspects that are, um, that are degrading coral reef ecosystems as we hear in the media or we can just ignore it and then things will only get worse. But um, so local things like overfishing, overfishing or the global more sewage like warming, treatment and yeah. all these things that really your coral reefs are adapted to an environment that's not used to all of the input and all of the changes that we give it. Um, but I would I would say there is definitely a future for coral reefs. Um, I I'm not too confident in the in the ability of us humans yeah. to turn everything around tomorrow. It's probably going to take a bit longer. Yes, uh, but I am very confident in the ability of coral reefs to survive and to adapt. Um, we see species that are actually increasing with all of the stressors um, that we give to the reef. We see that these reefs are changing. They're not necessarily dying. There's some sites that are dying, some sites that are flourishing, probably a bit more that are dying, but overall these reefs will change. And the way they change uh, Yes, we're going to have more sponges on them, um, but that might actually be a good thing. Uh, we're not so sure about that, but, but we're getting there, and it seems like yeah. sponges are kind of reducing a lot of the impacts, the, the, the downward impacts that, that you get from all of the stresses we put in. Um, but I do think there will be coral still, obviously. Um, there will be still a very diverse community. Uh, it might not be as colorful as the reefs we've seen before. Or might be more colorful than the more sponges. Or more colorful, yeah, <laughs> spo exactly. So, yeah, it's, it's really hard to say, but um, these, these ecosystems are incredibly strong and they will survive. Um, the next question is from uh, Florian. Um, we've talked a lot about sponges. I think there is a, a wider understanding of the importance of coral, but maybe less so about sponges. Why are sponges important? Um, so what we find is that 
the most important function sponges that we think sponges are performing is the cycling and the retention of energy. So a lot of the waste products I mentioned before that are released by the other organisms are being taken up by the sponges. And what they do, they turn it into tiny particles which then are released, end up in the sediment and those then fuel more production and more, um, more diversity on the reef as a whole. Everything can basically feed on what the sponges poop out. Okay. Yeah. So they're almost like fertilizers <laughs> of the reef. Um, Carol, thank you, Carol, for this, this great question. Uh, Carol would like to know what is the best part and the worst part of being an ocean scientist? Ooh, okay. The best part of being an ocean scientist, I would say, is definitely the ver variety of my work. Yeah. You know, on one day I'm a construction worker and I'm building some structures that I want to put out on the reef. The next day I'm a scientific diver putting these structures on the reef. The next day I'm a lab technician, come in, mm. I process my samples. Uh, sometimes I need to be an author and write my things up. Uh, right now I'm a communicator, so every, every yes. day is really different and I have so many different job titles. That variety is really what I love most about being an ocean scientist. Brilliant. And, um, and what, what, what's the downside? What's the is, downside? Is there a downside? Uh, marine scientists they tend to have a big ego. <laughs> so it's definitely a, it's, it's a competitive, but it's also a collaborative environment. Um, I would say the biggest downside is... Yeah, not that. The biggest downside is that, we're, that it's so much more difficult to bring things in the ocean, to do experiments in the ocean. And that's why we're lacking behind a lot. If you look at terrestrial ecosystems, we've, yeah. we've really nailed them down a lot. And a lot of the ecological theory comes from these terrestrial systems. And it's nice to use those insights and, and look at what we find on the reef, if that matches what happens in terrestrial ecosystems. But, but we're so far behind. We're many, many decades behind uh, what they found. And that's a bit frustrating to me, but it's also an opportunity to you because there's so many things we still need to find out. So we need Perfect. dedicated, motivated scientists that use all these exciting technologies and go out and, and nail this down. Well, I, mean, I think there's, you know, to put that in, in, in the wider context, there's probably a, a lower appreciation of, of the ocean and marine habitats among the general population. Mm -hmm. um, but we see there's, you know, great work both through the media and, and through science to start to to create that balance between the marine and terrestrial systems. Media, maybe they go a bit too much to the doom and gloom. Um, I think that's what, But yes. it does have an effect. Obviously, people are talking about marine ecosystems yeah. more so than in the past. I totally agree. Uh, when I started this career, that was back in 2011, yeah. uh, I, I remember I was going home, I was talking to my friends and my family about, you know, all these, all this stuff I'm seeing in my class and my professors telling me how much we wreck havoc with this ecosystem. And everyone would be like, eh, what are you talking about? Like, it's just a whole bunch of rocks that change color, right? But that's not the case. Um, we're actually destroying very, very valuable ecosystems yep. here. And today when I go home and I talk to my friends and my family, it's not me who educated them, it's, it's our society. Today, they, they talk about it. They come to me and they say, hey, I know you're doing this. I've read this article. I've seen this news report. What do you think about it? Is it really like that? And so there's definitely an, an increased interest and also an increase in funding. Okay. So with more funding, obviously, we can do more. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Um, next question this is from Olaf. Is, uh, what was the moment that you, you knew you wanted to be a marine scientist, an ocean scientist? I didn't really have such a moment, to be honest. Um, I kind of just ended up here. So in my case, the, I actually started off doing bioengineering. Okay. Um, and then what I didn't like about that so much is that it was always about money. There was always a, a money incentive. Some company wanted us to optimize something or to build something so they can make so money. Applied research. Uh, rather, yeah. Very applied, but not so environmental, more very industrial and commercial. Okay. So how can we use natural things to make money basically yeah. and I didn't like that so much I wanted to go in a field where it's more about the uh, just for about the nature the natural yeah. aspect uh, that's why I ended up in environmental sciences okay and I kind of just followed the things I'm good at and that I like I, I like diving uh, my professors were pushing me to marine science because they saw there was some sort of motivation 
Um, and then when I started, did my masters, I actually wanted to, you know, go into the industry again and see what I can do there. But my professors were like, "No, you have to do a PhD <laughs> in marine science." And I was a bit skeptic, but I started, and now I'm so happy I did. Brilliant. So yeah, I kind of just ended up here. Fantastic. Uh, we've got a number of questions that have been coming through on the live chat. Um, we've got Sally in Manchester mm -hmm. uh, who would like to know, is Darwin an inspiration for you? He is, but uh, so are many, many other scientists. And what Darwin managed is he managed to communicate his science very effectively. So he is the one we remember today when actually there was a whole bunch of researchers working on what he worked on. Um, so I look at Darwin's work, obviously he was a genius and he did his yeah. stuff very well, but there's, there's many, many people that inspire me, uh, some of which even more so than Darwin's work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. any, any, any names we're, we're going to... Wallace would be one, for example. Okay. Wallace was uh, somebody in the Indo-Pacific working actually at the same time than Darwin and working on the same things. Yep. And he tweaked the little things a bit more and he, he actually also contributed very much to our understanding of evolution today. But we don't talk about him. No. We always talk about Darwin because he was the one communicating it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pipe in for, for, for me in the, like, modern ocean science. I love the combination of engineering and discovery that Sylvia Earle mm -hmm. has made possible. So she's, she's one of my great heroes in terms of, of modern uh, marine science and modern, uh, c discovering our oceans. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a second question here um, from Michelle. Um, you said coral reefs are solar cities. Can we use corals and sponges in technology for the future? Can we start to, to use them to help us out? Wow, okay, that's a very creative question. Um, I, mean, I think certainly just, well, uh, you ha have a think, and I, I'll just reply with one example I, I heard Go earlier, ahead. which was um, using freshwater sponges as potential for cleaning up um, you know, dirty rivers or mm -hmm. you know, because of their filtering mm -hmm. um, mechanism, uh, perhaps their use in aquaculture to take up any of the excess yeah. the bacteria that mm -hmm. are produced that are a problem mm -hmm. for aquaculture yeah. to fish farming at the moment. Yeah. So when you do aquaculture, particularly fish farming, you get a lot of waste products off the fish and a lot of money is being spent in taking these waste products out of the water. Yeah, you could just place them, if you place the right sponges in there, they will do the, the work for you. But are, so, are we going to see street lamps powered by coral in the future? Well, in that <laughs> sense, we're actually already using that technology. Are we? We're, we have solar panels. Yes. So it's maybe not the exact same way a coral would do photosynthesis. And um, I'm pretty sure if we are able to put biological photosynthesis into a technic technological panel, that will be a lot more efficient than the panels we have today. Now, deep in the recesses of my, of my memory is an example of using phytoplankton, so marine algae, mm -hmm. for, for some kind of lighting purposes. Mm. And so I will let the team, it's deep, deep, deep in my memory, if we can find this online, that is, that is uh, because that's the same you know, type of living thing that we find inside the, the coral. That's true, yeah. So phytoplankton inside the coral does, of course, photosynthesis. And this process is a lot more efficient than our photosynthesis, where we uh -huh. know heat up little water streams and then via conduction get that into electricity. Um, so yeah, biological energy uh, acquisition is something very exciting, but I think we're still very, very far away from, from that. What I do see what we can use is the medical potential of reefs. Okay. Not only corals, but particularly sponges they, they're always in contact with water and with microbes and some yeah. of these are really bad microbes so they need to make sure that they defend themselves and that they have very strong immune systems. Um, so there's actually a lot of metabolites and, and, and compounds produced by sponges that we can extract or other organisms on the reef and turn into medicines. So I think that's a really, really big potential for technology in the future. Amazing. We talked a little bit about sponges um, eating um, sort of like waste matter. Um, this is a sack and Birkenhead would like to know, do corals poo? Do corals poo? Yeah, yeah. obviously corals poo. Uh, <laughs> even the there same... Exact, obviously yeah. corals poo. Corals are animals, uh, so just like us, they have very similar uh, metabolic pathways, so they poo even the same compounds that we poo. So but metabolic pathways is, kind is of basically they, you know, they take food in through a mouth as a digestion and then it comes out 
the it's waste like, product imagine, come out the other way. Imagine we're sweating out our poo in liquid form. That's how a coral would poo, I assume. Okay. <laughs> there's a, there's, a, there's a, an image for you, Zach, this morning um, of how corals uh, get rid of their waste matter. Um, and we're going now to Manchester. Um, how do you make sure you do not harm the coral reef uh, when you're doing your research? That's a very good question. And um, obviously on this photo, you could, have, you could see that there were these flaps which were lying onto the reef. Um, so anything that was underneath was probably not doing so well. Um, there's always a trade-off. Um, this particular site was a very degraded site. Uh, and we spent quite some time looking for a spot where we only have fleshy algae that yeah. we would damage because that grows back very, very quickly and uh, it's actually not too convenient to have too much of it on the reef. Uh -huh. um, but putting a flap like that on a coral would kill it and that would pr certainly be a bad thing. Yep. Um, so we, we have to be careful and if we use these chambers, we actually go out and we look for areas where we have you know, a natural reef system because we want this to be as close to nature yeah. as possible, but where we have like a sand patch and then we lie this into the sand rather than onto the reef. Okay. Uh, we keep our fins up when yeah. we work, uh, always, because you don't want to damage reefs no. that way. Um, making sure our equipment stays with us is also yep. very important. Um, so yeah, we, we just have to be very careful. Um, and it does work. When we do experiments that actually affect corals in some way, we yeah. go back, we find ways how to minimize that. Let's say I want to take a sample of coral tissue. Yep. I have to hammer this sample out and I'm heavily damaging this coral. But as a scientist, I need to know yes. what is the biomass of this coral. So it's, in, it's very valuable information. It hurts my heart to do this. But then what we do is we fill this hole with some marine grade epoxy. It's like a gluey okay. thing. And when we do this, the coral can easily grow over it again. And, if, and then we go back and we monitor this coral and we can verify that it has healed from this process. Same when we take organisms into the lab and we incubate them. We put them back out on the reef where they like to be and then yeah. we monitor them. And if something goes wrong and they're not doing so well, we're trying mm. to figure out what it was to avoid it the next time. Amazing. Thank mm -hmm. you for that. Um, I mean, you know, it, it is it is that um, paradox of, of researching a, a habitat that you do need to take the smallest sample possible, mm -hmm. but you do need to take samples mm -hmm. to, to, to start mm -hmm. to, to work. Going going away from the science side, uh, Katie would like to know, do you ever have fun underwater? Every single time. I don't know if I've ever been underwater without being in this in this intrinsically happy space. That's just something that I think all of us ocean scientists share. Yep. Um, this the favorite part of my job, to go okay. in and whatever I'm doing underwater, doesn't really matter. I'm of course focused, but there's always this part in my brain that goes, oh, this is my world, it's beautiful. Um, I, I, do, I, do I think that we managed to get some footage of you underwater having a bit of fun? Perfect. So we'll come on to the, into the um, next question is, um, <laughs> Paul in London uh, would like to know, sh should he still wash with a sponge? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> okay, so the sponges we have today that we use in the kitchen, yeah. uh, they're actually synthetic. So um, if you want to do something good for nature, then don't just throw the sponge away, this synthetic sponge, because yep. it is garbage. Uh, but whether you use a sponge or not, um, it doesn't really have to do anything with the sponges we have out on the reef. Um, yeah. So, I mean, so, so it used to, used to be the actual natural sponge. There used to be this industry, right. And then there were sites where sponges were taken out a lot to get these, these yeah. natural sponges and bring them into the households. Uh, but yeah, that's not the case anymore. That's not the case. So we use synthetic sponges and perhaps we could even think about other, I think there's now sort of loofers used as a, as a washing, so we don't use a sort of a plastic and synthetic yeah, thing. Yeah, so yeah, that would be a nice Natural thing. alternatives. We've gone from creating a, a synthetic alternative so we don't take too much from nature. Mm -hmm. And now we're looking at other materials because we're realizing- Synthetic, sustainable. Yes, so we're, yeah. we're realizing that the synthetic waste that we're creating um, has the unintended consequence of, of getting into the environment and causing pollution. 
Mm. So there are some natural alternatives that people are yeah, starting to explore. Yeah, there's always natural sustainable alternatives, or almost always. Um, we've got time for one last question, and that is coming from Manchester. Is this like a coral prison? It's mm. like putting a, a coral in jail. It depends on which <laughs> coral we're talking about. Uh, I'm sure there's some corals that would feel very imprisoned in this chamber. Yeah. Um, but there's also some corals that would see this as a five-hour vacation. <laughs> because you don't have all the... You, obviously, you're confined and you don't get all this yeah. nice replenishment of new water. But also, you don't have your competitors in here. You don't have, you know, other things trying to grow over you. Um, Eat you. Eats you, exactly. So I, I don't know what a coral thinks, if a coral <laughs> thinks anything, but I could imagine that um, this can be quite relaxing for them for a little bit. Nick, very sadly, that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much uh, for sharing not only you know, ideas around how you, you, you research the reef, um, but also you know, showing us that amazing underwater footage, that reconstruction, that 3D reconstruction of the roof. It's been amazing, so thank you. My pleasure. Um, thank you to all the classes uh, who've been watching. It's been amazing having you. Great, great questions. And for now, it is goodbye from Coral Life. Do join us again in 45 minutes for a Q&A. Uh, and then tomorrow, we've got some great, great sessions where we go deeper on the reef uh, with PIM's team. Um, but until then, it's bye-bye from Curacao and bye-bye from Coral Life. Bye.